It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Dean Jean Johnson. Um, Jean is a remarkable woman. She is a visionary. She is, she is a leader. Um, I've known Jean for a hundred years. Um, and <laughs> nearly. <laughs> <yeah>. Nearly. <laughs> In 2005, Jean said to me, um, we're going to start a, a, a department of nursing education. Would you like to work with us? And um, boy, once we got on that horse, um, we have been we have been on to the races since then. Jean had a vision, and we have been working to implement that vision. And you are the result of this vision. It is incredible. We were Jean created the Department of Nursing Education in 2005, and in 2010, we became the 10th school at the George Washington University. That is unbelievable. And it's all because of the faculty who is led by Dean Johnson. It's remarkable. Jean has been extensively involved in the national leadership of nurse practitioner education throughout her career. She served as president of the National Organization of Nurse Practitioner Faculties and president of the American College of Nurse Practitioners. She has been active in legislative and regulatory policy focusing on nursing issues. She has co-chaired a national task force on the evaluation criteria for nurse practitioner programs and has facilitated the advanced practice registered nurse consensus group that established a new regulatory model for advanced practice nursing. In addition, she served on the Pew Health Professions Commission the National Fund for Medical Education, and the Institute of Medicine's Committee on the Future of Primary Care. She was a fellow in the Primary Care Health Policy Fellowship. She was also a national program director for a $20 million project to take primary care educational programs to underserved areas nationwide. And she was principal investigator of the National Nursing Emergency Preparedness Preparedness Initiative and is spearheading efforts to train nurses to be prepared for terrorism and national disasters. In addition, she has worked internationally on national is on international issue nursing issues in Saudi Arabia, Eritrea, and South Africa. Um, she was co-PI of a Robert Wood Johnson um, grant and is a senior consultant for the National Alliance for Quality Care, and has worked in quality improvement in nursing homes, creating innovative materials and presentation to the members of the American Healthcare Association for many years. I give you our Dean, Jean Johnson. Yes. That's way too much information. <laughs> in fact, um, you know, the thing is, is that when um, I think as everyone here knows, you know, when you do something, um, it's, it's really that you take one step at a time, one step, one step, one step, and then you end up someplace <laughs> and you kind of look back and you go, really? Um, you know, I have to say in terms of the school um, of nursing, which has been I think one of the real highlights, certainly of my career, but, it, but it's true, I did not do that alone by any means. Um, and there's one particular person here that I want to recognize, and that's Dr. Ellen Dawson. Please stand up. Who was the senior associate dean um, for the school. She was the first and only department chair of um, nursing education at GW. And quite honestly, you know, um, I think that Ellen, as well as all the faculty, have um, taken credit. Now, um, you know, certainly welcome, everybody. Uh, it sounds like the morning so far has gone well. You know, you'll be getting a lot of information today, tomorrow. Um, and then I hope you all really enjoyed your summer. <laughs> <laughs> Because let me tell you, it's done. <laughs> it's over. 
Um, but, you know, you're really embarking on um, something that's so important in your career. You all have made a decision, you know, to move forward and to, you know, expand your knowledge um, and prepare yourself for some, some new roles and some new adventures in life. And um, Kate had asked me to talk about leadership today. And um, I wanted to walk you through first some stories. And the stories that um, I wanted to begin with is the next slide. And I think that I can just do that from. Oops, I just, okay, so is there some magical thing? No, there's not a magical thing. It's this big green arrow that was so big, I couldn't see it. <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to walk you through some stories of nurses that I think um, have been really outstanding. Now, this is simply a very, very small snapshot um, but we're going to draw some conclusions from these folks because certainly there are many, many, many more leaders. And I've got some leaders that go back away, some leaders that go back not so far, and some current leaders. So Mary Breckenridge. Has everyone heard of Mary Breckenridge? Okay, some of you have and some of you haven't. Um, she founded the Frontier Nursing Service. Probably everybody in this room is familiar with the pictures of nurses on horseback riding into the countryside in the hollers of Kentucky. Um, Mary Breckenridge was actually born to a family that was, that was privileged. Um, her father had served um, for in the administration of Grover Cleveland. Her, um, he was then appointed ambassador to Russia. You know, she had a lot of different experiences. She married um, someone who is, is written about as who she felt was her true soulmate. And um, unfortunately, he died two years after they were married, and there were no children. She went, he died of appendicitis, actually, and she went um, to a school of nursing following that you know, trying to find some meaning in her life and sort of, I think the experience with her husband dying of a, of a appendicitis was very instrumental in kind of, you know, wanting to go into a healthcare area. And certainly at the time, you know, nursing was a major route. She got her nursing degree, she remarried, she had two children. Her second child, um, died six hours after being born. And her son, who was her first child, died at age four of appendicitis. You know, what are the chances of that, really? And, you know, being um, pretty devastated, she went to France. Um, there was World War I going on, and she um, applied her nursing skills. And, and after going to France, she went to um, England. And she worked with some midwives. And she didn't, you know, she had never thought about midwifery, but she had learned how to be a midwife. And she understood that the midwifery skills could be applied to people, you know, in really who were underserved. And she came back and she settled in a place called um, Hayden, Kentucky, and started the Frontier Nursing Service. And I have to tell you that the Frontier Nursing Service is a, is a service where um, in looking at the outcomes of women in terms of um, infections, uh, maternal mortality, um, infant mortality, their statistics in Hyden, Kentucky, in the middle of nowhere, were better than hospitals in New York City and Chicago and other big cities. Um, so she was um, an individual who, um, you know, really changed kind of the perception of nursing in a very major way. Okay, Mabel Keaton Stoppers, who was 
from Barbados, came to the US when she was, I think it was around um, 13, went to the Freedmen's Hospital Nursing School in Harlem, graduated, and realized how awful the situation was in terms of segregation. And she worked in Harlem for years in terms of implementing health programs for the people living in Harlem. She became um, instrumental in challenging the American Nurses Association and the National League of Nursing in terms of opening up their membership to people of color. Because up until that time, the ANA, the NLN, and every other nursing organization forbid membership of black or Hispanic individuals and nurses. So having graduated from nursing school in 1917, she then, um, the, the changes that came about in the ANA and NLN happened in um, 1946 and 1947. So that took her 30 years of commitment. And 30 years of commitment to integrating nursing. Um, she also, during World War II, was very instrumental in integrating black nurses into the care of, of our military and our soldiers. Because up until that time, and I suspect everybody knows the story of the Tuskegee Airmen and you know, the segregation that, that took place um, in the military, which reflected what was going on in the country. Um, Mabel Stoppers actually was successful in integrating the military nurse corps um, in terms of black nurses. So she was um, noted to be, you know, time, Scientist of the Year. She was inducted into the ANA Hall of Fame um, back in 1996. And has, um, there's a book, and I'm actually forgetting, The, the Power of Prejudice, I think it is, um, um, that's out, that if you want to read anything that has, you know, really a rich set of stories about the, the kinds of challenges that she faced, it's really a remarkable book. Okay, Michael Carter, Dean Emeritus from UT Memphis. Um, he has been one of the folks in nursing um, probably more recently, certainly since um, the 19, late 1960s and early 70s that really has promoted men in nursing. So all of you fellows in this <laughs> class you know, and, um, Michael has been a role model for men in nursing around the country and, in fact, around the world. He's also someone who has taken a very strong leadership role in terms of education. Um, he's a nurse practitioner. He's a family nurse practitioner. Um, and he has challenged the boundaries of nursing, I think, for his entire career. And um, we've actually been really fortunate because we've had um, Dr. Carter work with us uh, when we were developing our Doctorate of Nursing Practice program. And um, I think that one of the things, um, one of his major contributions is not only um, promoting men in nursing, but he has also um, been just very instrumental in, in promoting nurse practitioners and um, in, in many, many ways. Sue Hassmiller. Has anybody heard of Sue Hassmiller? Has anybody heard of the IOM report on the future of nursing? OK, so I get a lot of nods. OK, Sue Hassmiller is the architect of the IOM report. And she is um, a special a senior consultant to the president, um, Risa Levisa More, of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is the most, is the largest health care foundation in the world. Um, they have, I think, about now $11 billion um, in their um, corpus of their funds, of which they have to spend about 5% of that every year in terms of um, 
um, it's sort of federal law. And Sue has really created an entire set of programs that has lasted for a decade that the Robert Wood Johnson has funded to strengthen nursing. And there's been a number of different projects um, related to quality improvement, related to you know, getting best practices out into you know, the, the communities, um, improving care in hospitals, and wanting to make um, a, a meaningful and lasting mark you know, the Institute of Medicine's report on the future of nursing um, practice, I think it has changed almost everything. Um, I was just in a meeting with one of the large um, health systems and you know, um, the chief nurse, the vice president for the entire system, you know, was talking about you know, that they were um, you know, increasing the educational opportunities for their nurses with associate's degree, degrees to get BSNs because the Institute of Medicine report calls for 80% of our workforce having a BSN by 2020. Um, that's meaningful. One of the other things in the IOM report is to address the barriers to efficient and effective practice for nurse practitioners. And that's most of you, not all of you, but most of you, you know, in terms of that work will affect your lives for decades to come. So Sue, um, being the architect, I think is probably one of the um, more humble folks, probably not really recognizing that almost everyone in the country, every school of nursing, every health system, you know, has looked at the Institute of Medicine report and is working to adopt you know, um, their full set of recommendations. Anybody here, Mary Wakefield? Okay, well, see, all these people are gonna become friends <laughs> for you over the next couple of years, which is great. You know, we've got some opportunities here. Um, Mary is the director of, um, within the Department of Health and Human Services, the Health Resources and Services Administration, which is a very powerful entity within HHS. And what they do is that they keep looking at workforce issues and kind of saying, okay, so how many nurse practitioners do we need? What's the skill set that they need? Well, how many physicians do we need? What's their skill set? You know, what about the allied health folks? Um, and also the entire community health clinic system comes under Mary's um, purview. And how many of you work in community health settings? Do any of you, some of you? Okay, well, that's Mary's purview. <laughs> um, and she comes from North Dakota and came to DC um, and worked for both Senators Kent Conrad and Quentin Burdick on the Hill. Um, she became, she was their chief of staff, actually, and she became um, one of the most knowledgeable nurses on the Hill in our history. Um, she led the efforts around rural health care, um, and that's why, you know, having her as the director of HRSA is really great because she understands the community clinic system and she understands what the, ch what the challenges are you know, for providers, for patients. Um, and you know, she's been a great supporter, obviously, of nurses. You know, she is uh, one of the folks. And she's very careful because in her role, she you know, um, is responsible for programs that govern, govern all health professionals. Um, and so you know, while I think one of her, you know, she certainly um, loves nursing and has done whatever she can to help, she really is very equitable. Anybody here of Marilyn Tavener? Okay, we've got, we've got one, we've probably got a couple. Um, Marilyn Tavener is the administrator of the Centers for Mer Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid um, takes care of, probably affects 
100 million people's lives in the US. I mean, you know, when you think about the Medicare and Medicaid programs, you know, these are our biggest health programs. And Marilyn um, had come to this position. You know, this is a very political position. You know, it's <coughs> got to be approved um, by Congress to be in this position. She um, started out at HCA, um, actually as a nurse, moved into, um, in not too long of a time, um, kind of moved up the chain of command to be um, the chief executive officer of one of HCA's hospitals. Then she became the regional um, person responsible for about seven or eight different um, HCA hospitals. And then she was tapped by Tim Kaine, who was governor of Virginia, to be the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the state of Virginia. From there, um, Don Berwick, who was then just approved as the administrator of CMS, um, pulled her into CMS to be the assistant administrator of CMS. And then when Don needed to leave, um, Marilyn Tavener, you know, um, while there were some folks that were threatening to not approve her for political, for, for reasons having nothing to do with her skills, um, but to make a point, you know, um, were going to hold out, but they just, they had approved her about six months ago, something like that. So Marilyn Tavener. Um, so we've got nurses in two of the highest positions you know, within our federal government, um, which is really remarkable. And as I just kind of focused on, you know, these particular individuals, I just wanted to give you the breadth of what, you know, kind of goes on and, and what happens. Now, what do these leaders have in common? They're all action-oriented. They all saw something that needed to be done you know, and did it, whether it was, you know, very, and, and this began actually very early in their careers. You know, um, for instance, um, Mary Wakefield had been involved in, in policy and she, from her state, knew that rural health care was a big problem. And so she, you know, um, became very knowledgeable about it, but she took action. And that was one of the things that, you know, um, is probably key to leadership. It's almost, it, it, it's like you, as I said at the very beginning, you have to take the first step. And then once you take the first step, there's momentum that is generated and you can keep walking. The reason we have a school of nursing <laughs> is because we took the first step and we started setting up meetings. And those meetings kept happening, and we had to have an agenda for every meeting, and we had to have something accomplished for every meeting. And it just kept things moving. And so taking action, working hard. All of these folks that you know, um, I have talked briefly about have worked really hard. They worked really hard in terms of preparing themselves you know, through education, through experiences, through reflection, through all kinds of activities. Um, and that takes time. And that's what you're doing now. You all are preparing yourselves for action. And you're going to be working hard. <laughs> you're going to be working very hard. Um, but it's going to be rewarding. And that's one of the things, you know, um, for, for every one of these folks is that, you know, the work that they're doing is meaningful to them. They are passionate. They are persistent in terms of following a path. That path is not always a straight line. That path oftentimes, you know, kind of wanders and you know, um, you may wonder what on earth is your next step going to be, but you know, nevertheless, everybody is on a path. They also didn't let fear dominate their decisions. Every single one of these folks have had to take positions around 
things that they are passionate about. And taking a position is often a pretty lonely place. Um, you can take a position and sometimes have followers, or you can take a position and there's nobody standing behind you. And yet you're really convinced that you know, what you want to do, what you have in your sights, is, is the right thing to do. And these folks, in terms of not letting fear dominate, you know, were then willing to take risks. Taking the risk, you know, Marilyn Tavener, you know, being approved, having to be reviewed by Congress, knowing how dysfunctional Congress is right now, you know, that's big. You know, taking on the community health system, um, the clinic system, that's big. Trying to get, you know, integrate nursing, that's big. Taking care of, you know, figuring out a, a system of care to take care of some of the poorest women and children in our country. That's taking a risk. So, you know, I thought a lot about, you know, kind of, I don't know that forces of leadership is the right word. I don't know that forces is the right word. But, you know, it has occurred to me, and what I've seen over the years is that, you know, people move into leadership situations, sometimes simply because there is the opportunity to do that. Um, and, you know, a door opens, people say yes, and then they, they kind of move forward. Um, some people feel passionate about certain issues, and that moves them into a leadership position, oftentimes that they feel are totally unplanned, but because they feel strongly about something, that kind of happens. And then some people actually plan, you know, a trajectory, you know, in terms of, if I do this, I can get to there, and I can get to there, and, and that's great. Every single one of these paths is absolutely viable and important. Um, and, I, and I think um, kind of reflecting on your own path and what you have thought. For me personally, um, I've never had a plan. So, you know, for people who do have a plan, I so respect that and admire it. You know, I have been one of these folks that probably fall into the opportunity issue, you know, sort of categories. I feel very strongly about um, a number of different things. I feel very strongly about nurse practitioner practice. I feel strongly about the care of our elderly. I feel strongly about the disenfranchised um, from the health system of our poor and vulnerable people. Those are things that I feel passionate about. But I've had really good luck. You know, I've had some doors open. You know, people have said, gee, would you want to do such and such? And I would go, sure. <laughs> kind of, why not? Um, and saying yes is oftentimes one of the ways um, to leadership positions, even if you don't know that saying yes at that point, you know, is, is where you're going to end up. So anyway, I think that there are a number of different ways of becoming leaders. And so what are you? You know, I think that there's, you know, some self-reflection that you have clearly already done because you're here. <laughs> and, and, and that, you know, you all are, you, you've had experiences, you've, you've seen things, you've um, seen the world in, in ways that you know, people who um, have not gotten into a, or to a graduate level of education yet have not seen. But, you know, one of the things that you really need to consider, you know, um, because there's a lot of talk about, you know, are you leading or are you managing or exactly what are you doing? And leading and managing are two different things. Leading is creating change. Managing is probably keeping the status quo. And that's okay, too. Everybody has, um, in fact, this should be, are you a leader and or <laughs> manager? Because everybody's got to manage, and particularly if you're a leader, you know, you lead and you manage. So how can you be a more effective leader? Because my guess is that every single person in this room is leading something. And it could be um, in your work area, it could be in your family. You might be the glue that keeps holding, you know, all your family members <laughs> together and communicating. Um, 
It may be that you're really thinking big that you want to be secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. I mean, you know, um, it could be any of those things. But, you know, kind of reflecting on how can you be more effective? And what is your, your tolerance, need for, or fear of change? You know, because, and, and this takes some real root thinking because everybody goes, yeah, change is a way of life. And um, at a certain level, everybody says, oh, yeah, I love change. You know, the thing is, though, is that when change affects individuals personally, it feels different and it's not comfortable. It's really not comfortable. You'll be, and you'll be in situations um, making this transition in terms of your, your master's program, you're going to be in situations that you have never been in before. You know, I can remember <laughs> my own um, kind of move from being a nurse to being a nurse practitioner. And I thought, whoa, I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, this is really, really um, beyond what I thought you know, I would be doing. Significantly challenged, but have loved every single day. And knowing what you feel passionate about, you really, you really need to get in touch with your passion and know what keeps you from taking action. What are those barriers? Because every day, all of us see something, are aware of something that we don't take action on. Hundreds of things every day that we don't take action on. I read about Egypt, I read about Syria, and I kind of go, I have no idea what to do. And I don't take action. And I know that. So there are a lot of things that we don't take action on, but we have to be clear about what we can take action on and do something meaningful. OK, I have a little um, YouTube video that I wanted to um, show you all. And I think it should be coming up. This is actually so wonderful because all this If stuff you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. 
when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. So the bottom line message is, while I've been talking about leadership, no leader does anything by themselves. So thank you. <laughs>